Good evening. Good evening. I'm Marjorie Lampmead, Associate Director of the Wade Center, and we're delighted to have you here this evening. Um, it is once again my pleasure to welcome back a longtime friend of the Wade Center, Dr. Joel Heck. Joel and his wife Cheryl have been frequent visitors throughout the years whenever Joel has come to research in the Kilby Reading Room. Dr. Heck is cer currently serving Redeemer Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas as assisting pastor. However, on August 1st, he will begin a two-year position as interim president at Concordian Lutheran Seminary in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Prior to this, Dr. Heck taught for more than three decades at two different Concordia universities in the States. <coughs> His courses primarily have focused on the Old Testament as well as on C.S. Lewis and his life. The author or editor of 16 books, Dr. Heck has written four volumes on C.S. Lewis. Um, Joel's magnum opus in so many ways continues to remain his website, Chronologically Lewis. If you haven't taken a look at that and you love Lewis and you want to know more about his life, you ought to look that up. Um, it's a comprehensive listing of daily events in the life of both C.S. Lewis and his brother Warren. And it's, Joel has pulled from so many different sources and it's a very authoritative place to find information. This invaluable resource is regularly consulted by Lewis scholars as well as by those who are simply readers of Lewis's books. Recently, Joel and his daughter Brenda wrote a children's book in the tradition of Narnia entitled The Lion That Roared. So you can check that out as well. This evening, Dr. Heck will be, open, will be offering his insights on Lewis's The Abolition of Man. Immediately following Dr. Heck's presentation, there will be a time of Q&A that will be moderated by our Wade co-director, Dr. Crystal Downing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joel Heck. Thank you very much, Marge. And I would like to I ask you to receive on behalf of the Wade Center this framed set of stamps, the Lord of the Rings stamps, that uh, actually Walter Hooper gave that to me in 2004 when I was helping him uh, with the tail end of the editing of volume three of Collected Letters. Well, and so you. I wrote that on the back that it was from Walter Hooper to me now to the Wade Center and hope you enjoy uh, those Tolkien stamps. You're welcome. Well, we're going to talk about teaching the abolition of man, first presented by C.S. Lewis as a series of three lectures at the University of Durham in Newcastle, England on February 23 to 25, 1943, during the Second World War, which is somewhat significant. The Riddle Memorial Lectures given annually were founded in 1928 by Sir Walter Riddle in memory of his father, Sir John Buchanan Riddle, who had served as chairman of the University Grants Committee and as High Sheriff of Northumberland. The lectures explored the relationship between religion and contemporary thought. Like his father, Sir Walter was a devout Christian active throughout his life in public affairs. Most people who enjoy the writings of C.S. Lewis know that The Abolition of Man is one of his most important, most prophetic, and most enduring works. That would make it the G-O-A-T, <laughs> the greatest of all time, at least among Lewis's writings. A 2013 National Review poll rated it the seventh most important work of nonfiction of the past century. The same poll that placed mere Christianity in number, the number 26 spot. John West has called abolition the best defense of natural law to be published in the 20th century. Most people also know that abolition is difficult to understand and difficult to teach. Michael Ward's recent book, After Humanity, has made the message of abolition much more accessible and his discussion questions lead the reader into the text. However, even those excellent questions are not connected to the relevant portions of abolition, so that though the questions generally proceed in order from uh, the beginning of the, the book to the end of the book, the reader is left wondering where in the text of abolition any of Ward's questions should be discussed. 
Well, goodness, truth, and beauty, ethics, rationality, and aesthetics are not in the eye of the beholder, Lewis writes. He says, good is indeed something objective and reason the organ whereby it is apprehended. This idea most clearly articulated in abolition is so central to Lewis's thought that Lord Michael Ward claims abolition might even be described as the philosophical theme of Lewis's output and his other works as his variations. Furthermore, these virtues are not recent phenomena, nor are they the private property of Christians. Lewis writes, the idea, at least in its grossest and most popular form, that Christianity brought a new ethical code into the world is a grave error. Ethical codes have existed from be the beginning of time and in every place. That fundamental position in the abolition of man is worthy of being taught in a world that has gone far astray from ethical norms. It could be that the survival of our species, rather than going the way of what Lewis calls the trousered ape, depends upon restoring the views that Lewis expresses in this important book. <coughs> One feature that makes abolition difficult to comprehend is Lewis's use of key terms, sometimes without defining them. Therefore, one useful preliminary to teaching abolition is to define the following terms which are used in the book. The Tao, subjectivism, scientism, the abolition of man, <coughs> men without chests. So let's define them. The Tao. The key idea of the Tao is that certain human responses and emotions are appropriate and others inappropriate. It is the doctrine of objective value, the belief that certain attitudes are really true and others really false to the kind of thing the universe is and the kind of things we are. That's quoting Lewis himself. Lewis argued that the Tao is a common core values to be found in the ethical teachings of all major cultures throughout history. Subjectivism, the claim that all statements of aesthetic or moral value are merely reports of the speaker's emotional state which do not correspond to external reality. Scientism, the view that only what can be observed and measured by scientific methods is objective or valid. Scientism views science as the sole source of knowledge for our lives. It therefore assumes naturalism, the idea that nature is everything Scientism is not the same as science. Science is simply the attempt to understand and describe nature. One version of scientism was verificationism that showed up especially in his book, That Hideous Strength. Ver verificationism claimed that a statement is meaningful only if it can be verified or refuted by some possible observation. According to this view, religious, aesthetic, or ethical statements are meaningless, and if they are meaningful at all, it is only as indirect statements about our emotions. Thus, scientism leads to subjectivism and wreaks <coughs> havoc upon the Christian faith. Men without chests. Following Plato, Lewis argued that there are three elements significant for human motivation, the intellect or reason, what he calls the head, the appetite or desire, the belly, and the affections or heart, the chest. As Plato said, the head rules the belly through the chest. The problem with scientism, Lewis thinks, is that it has no room for the heart or what we might now call the affective dimension. Since it denies that our valuations are ever valid, all we are left with is reason and desire, the head and the belly, which leads to all kinds of selfishness and the destruction of community. Lewis followed Aristotle in thinking that we can and should educate people not merely to think, but also to have appropriate attitudes to care about what is objectively value, valuable. In other words, he thought we had a responsibility to create people with well-developed hearts, and I believe that's one reason why he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. <coughs> the Abolition of Man. Lewis thought that the Tao is what makes humans human. While our intellect makes us spiritual and our appetites make us animal, the chest which mediates between the head and the appetites makes us human. Scientism threatens to exclude the Tao on the grounds that value judgments are not scientific. When the chest is excluded, humans will come to regard themselves as no more than another piece of nature. 
Without any ethical guidelines, humans thus become the objects of all sort of experimentation and eugenics as suggested by that hideous strength. The human conquest of nature now becomes the human conquest of humanity itself. While other conquests of nature have given humans more power, this conquest threatens to enslave us and whoever has the most power will likely win. By the way, Lewis summarized the entire argument or most of the argument of the abolition of man in an essay entitled The Poison of Subjectivism. During the summer months of 1943, this essay appeared in a periodical called Religion and Life. And if you think about the timing of it, his lectures at uh, University of Durham, February of that year, and this article uh, just a few months later. So if you want to read a shortened version, a condensed version, a Reader's Digest condensed version of The Abolition of Man, and then decide whether you want to go on to the full thing, uh, look up The Poison of Subjectivism and read that. So I'm going to teach you this evening, or at least invite you, at least mentally, to do an exercise with me, one that I did not uh, come up with, but one that I'm borrowing from another author. Uh, objective value refers to the way the universe is. Too often, however, people confuse an opinion about something with that something's actual nature, or favorite term of Lewis, it's quiddity. In an exercise designed to show the difference between fact and opinion, or between raw data and values, Mark Roberts constructed a critical thinking exercise. In a chapter written by Michael Miller, Miller reports that Roberts asked students to identify which of the following six statements were facts and which of them were opinions, and these six statements followed. So you've seen the first one up there. Mozart was born in Salzburg. Mozart wrote beautiful music. John Paul II was pope for over 20 years. John Paul II was a good pope. Bell bottoms were popular in the 1970s. Bell bottoms are cool. Uh, this is Mark Roberts, okay? So I want you to think about this. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or ask people to write something down. I used to ask my students to write down whether it's a fact or an opinion, but just mentally come up with your own decision. Uh, are, which are facts and which are opinions? Are they all one or the other? And mentally figure out your own answers to this exercise that Mark Roberts put together. All right, fair enough, you got it done. Let's take a look at uh, the results of at least Mark Roberts' perspective, which I think is correct. And this is the surprising fact, maybe not surprising to many of you, all six statements are facts. And I think that gets to the heart of the argument that Lewis provides in The Abolition of Man. Only the odd-numbered statements are easily understood it as facts. Statements two and four deal with beauty and goodness, and both beauty and goodness have definite criteria for excellence. Statement six about bell bottoms, I think, simply injects Robert's sense of humor. In the field of music, for example, melody, form, harmony, and rhythm enable us to determine if a piece of music is well written or beautiful. For the characteristic of goodness, we can say that integrity, keeping one's promises, helping rather than harming are some of the objective criteria for goodness. But uh, here's part of the rub that Michael Eshelman talked about in his book, The Restitution of Man. Modern scientific doctrine, Eshelman says, holds all fact to be objective and all value to be subjective. And Lewis argues that that's not really the case. And he argues that in The Abolition of Man. Well, let's get into the abolition of man a little bit. Uh, well, one slide before that. And I've asked certain professional musicians, not my wife, by the way, even though she is a musician, they tell me, uh, university level professors tell me that mu Mozart's music is beautiful whether we happen to like it or not. Pope John Paul II was a good pope whether you are Catholic or not. No matter what you think, bell bottoms are not cool. <laughs> Again, that's Robert's sense of humor. 
summary uh, of this exercise, all the odd-numbered statements are more obviously facts about beauty and goodness, but all the even-numbered statements are also objectively true. I think Lewis would tell us that. So let's get into the abolition of man. Many of you know that it's divided into three lectures, three days uh, of lectures at the University of Durham. And uh, these are the three sections. Part one, men without chests. The first chapter in the book laments the loss of objective standards of right and wrong, good and bad, goodness, truth, and beauty, and the loss of trained emotions and chests in favor of subjective feelings. Michael Ward in After Humanity calls this the checkup. And by the way, I think I skipped over that statement. Yes, this is uh, uh, with uh, credits to Peter Kreeft for this insight. The abolition of man can be summarized in the three parts. Part one is the negative chapter, so that's Peter Kreeft. Part two is the positive chapter, and part three is the prophetic chapter. So this is part one. Uh, Malcolm Geit believes that this series of lectures was not as well received as it ought to have been because of Lewis's treatment of the theme that it is sweet and seemly thing to die for one's country. Geit cites Wilfred Owen's poem, Dolce et Decorum Est, which characterizes the noble death as a lie told by the comfortable to the condemned. Lewis would have been better served to cite Owen's poem, assuming he knew of it, and acknowledge the fact that the noble death can be misused, even though it is true that greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Somebody famous said that at some point. <laughs> so at any rate, that's uh, Malcolm, Geitz, Malcolm Geitz's perspective on uh, the treatment of that issue. Remember that these essays, these lectures were given in 1943. They're still in the midst of the Second World War. Uh, as he gives these lectures. Part two, the way. This part challenges subjectivism and subjective values by the authors of the Green Book by pointing out their self-contradiction. Michael Ward calls this the diagnosis. The attempt to debunk traditional values, objective values is often based on a set of values which is thought to be new, but which in fact is simply a small selection from traditional values. The innovator will be unable in the end to explain why this selection is retained while the rest are rejected. So on a closer view, he, uh, he will have confirmed the given nature of all moral principles and the need to reject either all or nothing of traditional morality. Modern people who admit this are then likely not to accept all but to reject all since they believe that morality is human, that humanity is nature, and that nature is a thing to rule. But nature should not rule us. God gave us dominion over all living creatures, <coughs> Genesis 1:28, but he did not give us dominion over one another. He invited us to be servants of one another rather than lords. Part three, the abolition of man, <coughs> which contains the same title as the entire book, discusses man's power over nature and shows how man ceases to become man when he has debunked all traditional values. When all that says it is good has been debunked or refuted, Lewis says, what says I want remains. In other words, we then have no objective basis for choosing certain values, only personal desire, whim, or something equally subjective. Michael Ward calls this the prognosis, and Peter Kreeft calls this the prophetic section. Man's conquest of nature will be completed when human nature is conquered through conditioning or even through eugenics or genetic manipulation. <coughs> Values will then be a thing for humans to produce and to modify at will, not a thing to be guided by. The only force left to motivate us, Lewis says, will be natural impulses. Man's conquest of nature will result in man's total surrender to nature. And on the assumption of perfect genetic science, perfectly applied, Lewis suggests we may expect this surrender to be irreversible. He says, our wish to see through the mainspring of specifically human action is a magician's bargain. To see through all things is the same as not to see. 
So this is a summary of the three chapters, once again, in one slide. The problem with thinking that all values are subjective. <coughs> There's no reason why your values should be better than mine or vice versa or anyone's values should rise to the top. The way the inconsistency in stepping outside of the Tao and yet as the authors of a book Lewis challenges in the abolition of man, uh, they use some values that are really part of traditional morality. And he also talks here about the need to integrate the head with the chest, which is what trained emotions enable us to do. And then the third section, the problem with elevating subjective values above the Tao is that we abolish ourselves and actually the will to power is encouraged. Whoever is in control of the most people at that time will be the person that decides what values are preeminent. Or another way of saying it, the problem with subjectivism, subjectivism, the solution in objectivism, and what will happen if we don't solve the problem. If, as Lewis stated, that hideous strength is a novelistic embodiment of the abolition of man, the third book in his Ransom Trilogy, then we ought to be able to use the former to teach the latter. The length of that hideous strength creates a problem, however, so a summary of that hideous strength along with selected excerpts can partially solve that problem. Miller reminds us that to rebuild the moral imagination, we need to read good stories, especially imaginative stories, which speak to the imagination and enable the reader to understand a rational principle in the context of the events of the story. That hideous strength is a good story, even though it's one of the two books by Lewis that I totally disliked the first time I read it. But it grows on you uh, when you read it and understand it better. In that hideous strength, Mark Studdock illustrates the problems of a loss of objectivity, but he also ends up opting for objectivity in the end. Cameron Ry Wybro writes, Studdock's character takes us closer to the educational purpose of the abolition of man than do any of the purely villainous characters. For while the villainous characters represent the dehumanizing apotheosis of modern technology, technological society, the high point of modern technological society, Studdock, Wybro claims, demonstrates the opinions and attitudes that the authors of the Green Book, again, that book that Lewis is challenging in The Abolition of Man, have, including the influence of the inner ring and in his rejection of the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments, we see the repudiation of those same opinions and attitudes. Footnote on uh, that hideous strength. Uh, to, to go back to something I cited earlier, Lewis says in The Abolition of Man, the head rules the belly through the chest, the seat of magnanimity of emotions organized by trained habit into stable sentiments, the chest, magnanimity, sentiment, the affective domain, the heart, we sometimes say. These are the indispensable liaison officers between cerebral man and visceral man. It may even be said, Lewis writes, it is by the middle element that man is man, for by his intellect he is mere spirit, and by his appetite mere animal. So how do we teach this book? I, mean, I spent a, a good deal of time talking about uh, what the abolition of man is about, what its primary message is. The pedagogical approach to teaching the abolition of man will be depend upon a lot of things. The familiarity of the teacher with the book, I mean, it's imperative for the teacher to understand the book. The amount of classroom time prioritized for teaching the book. The importance with which the teacher regards the book. The educational level of the students and other factors. Before deciding how, to, how much time to spend or how many classroom exercises to use, the teacher must read the book and understand its major message. And it'll be helpful to read Michael Ward's after humanity. So uh, the focus of the following material is on college-age students and older, but a scaled-back version of some of the ideas will be useful among high school students as well. 
so we got to think about how much time we're going to spend teaching the abolition of man. I always used to spend one hour on it, and every time I taught the abolition of man in my Lewis class, I felt guilty that I didn't spend more time on it, but I also felt like I don't understand the book well enough to spend more time on it, so we're going to have to let that go. Uh, there are lots of different learning activities that we can adopt, and I, I have to say that this uh, lecture, this presentation is a work in progress because I don't consider myself to be an expert on the abolition of man, which is why I have uh, two co-authors uh, for the article that we are writing and hope to have published uh, sometime, uh, or at least submitted sometime in the next year. And uh, one of them is a uh, professional philosopher at the University of Texas. Uh, some of you might know the name Rob Coons. And another is uh, uh, a teacher uh, in a classical education school in Phoenix by the name of Josiah Peterson. So the three of us are working together uh, to collaborate on this. And so we've got, uh, we developed some discussion questions. And Michael Ward's questions are also helpful at different points. Uh, in the narrative as we think about how we might teach the abolition of man. So uh, this is one learning activity that uh, I do highly recommend. Uh, again, anybody that's going to teach the book has to know how much time they're going to spend on it. Uh, is this an exercise that you want to use? Might be a good one, especially for people that are brand new to the abolition of man, that students read this essay and write a summarizing uh, essay describing what Lewis is arguing in The Abolition of Man. But uh, also one thing that I've done fairly recently is to write a summary of each of the 71 paragraphs of The Abolition of Man. So I got this document with 71 paragraphs as sort of a Reader's Digest condensed version of The Abolition of Man, but trying to understand what Lewis is saying in each paragraph as I walk through his book and have had several people uh, critique that and uh, improve the, my prose. Then I chose 17 paragraphs out of those 71 that I consider to be the most important paragraphs. And then I have written or borrowed learning activities such as the discussion questions from Michael Ward or the fact versus value exercise that I used elsewhere for teaching these 17 paragraphs as representative of the key arguments that Lewis offers. And so I share with you, and de depending on how much time we want to take doing this, uh, some of the things that I highlighted among the uh, different sections of the abolition of man. So first of all, this is my <coughs> summary of paragraph two. Lewis picks out a representative illustration from the book in which the authors of The Control of Language describe the story of Coleridge and the Waterfall, discussing whether pretty or sublime was the correct description. The authors claim that the, those adjectives were only statements about the feelings of those who used those adjectives rather than something objectively true about the waterfall's qualities. <coughs> And so in each section, I have a paragraph summary. And then in italics, I put a uh, way in which that exercise might be taught to discuss the Coleridge at the Waterfall story, at least as told by King and Ketley, the two authors of the control of language, even though they got the story a little bit wrong in the telling of it. But at least accept as accurate what they uh, said, as well as how Lewis critiques that or use an ethical issue as an alternative to an aesthetic one, uh, since beauty, at least I find beauty, more difficult to evaluate than an ethical issue. So there are a few other PowerPoint slides about this initial one, since that the story of Coleridge at the Waterfall was always something that I did spend time on with my students in class. So we talk about that story, and one a uh, tourist says to Coleridge, he thinks the waterfall is sublime. Another one says it's pretty, and Coleridge uh, likes the word sublime, doesn't like the word pretty. And so was Coleridge, by using those adjectives, was he saying something about the waterfall or simply something about his feelings that he had when he observed the waterfall? Lewis says the former, Gaius and Titius, who are uh, Lewis's names for King and Ketley, say the latter. 
It's only something about our feelings. Lewis would argue that the emotions we get from an impressive waterfall are not sublime feelings, but feelings of veneration or humility, what Lewis calls their correlates. It's almost the opposite of the, the impressiveness of the waterfall. Now, I, I went online to find the waterfall that they were impressed by or thought was pretty, and I found a, the waterfall. And I, I'm not so sure I ag agree that that's an impressive waterfall, <laughs> partly because I've been to Niagara, and anybody that's been to Niagara, now that is impressive, but maybe for someone like uh, Coleridge who had never seen a, I don't know if he'd ever seen a waterfall before in his life, but this is the very falls, although it's, what, 150 s or more years after Coleridge and Dorothy and William Wordsworth were at uh, the falls on the River Clyde, so uh, you can make your decision about that. But at any rate, uh, Lewis argues somewhat like this. This is me talking. You won't have cute feelings while looking at something cute, and you won't have tall or proud feelings standing next to a seven-foot center for the Boston Celtics. I mean, you'll feel really small next to most NBA players. I, I don't know if you've ever been to an NBA game, but you watch an NBA game and you see the guards who are much smaller than the forwards in the center, and then you think, oh, those guys are short. And it, but if you ever get a chance to be close to the court, you find out that those guards tower above most of us as well. I mean, a short guard is six foot two, and that's a half a foot taller than I am. So I, I feel small next to a guard, not just a seven foot center. Lewis also says that following the logic of King and Ketley, the, uh, the idea uh, should be that this is sublime, this waterfall is sublime, that is impressive, leads to I have humble feelings. I feel, feel small or humble in the presence of something sublime. Lewis continues to argue, if you follow King and Ketley to their logical conclusion, the, the idea that you are contemptible means I have contemptible feelings when they may actually be just feelings, and your feelings are contemptible mean, means my feelings are contemptible, which both of those are fairly obviously absurd. So uh, Lewis argues in this early section of the book that Gaius and Titius are offering two propositions. First of all, all sentences containing a predicate of value are statements about the emotional state of the speaker rather than the waterfall or whatever the object is that one is looking at, and that all such statements about my feelings are unimportant. The practical result, Lewis writes, is a missed opportunity to teach what makes good writing. So that's the first of the uh, several options that I've selected. Second one I picked from paragraph 11. This is a, a summary of that paragraph. Lewis doubts that Gaius and Titius intended to offer philosophy instead of literary criticism. They slipped into it because the literary criticism is difficult and perhaps because they have misunderstood the educational needs of the moment. They have seen people swayed by propaganda. Lewis probably means wartime propaganda. And don't want people to be unduly influenced by emotional appeals. However, again, my summary, the problem isn't excess emotion. It's usually lack of trained ability to sense or perceive emotionally. The task of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts, he says in that paragraph. So I would, this is a way to teach it among students, to ask students what are the jungles that some people like to cut down, what are the deserts, and why do you think Lewis uses this type of very colorful imagery, why not something else? So these would be discussion questions designed to lead people into the text of the abolition of man. To develop that a little bit further, do you know anybody who has a hair trigger temper? Anyone who was afraid of his own shadow? 
Anyone whose outlook on life is excessively and unrealistically sad? Why are they this way? How could they be different? Maybe we, maybe all of us to some extent or another lack trained emotions in one or more of these areas. Lewis tells us in his book, the young person must be trained to feel pleasure, liking, disgust, and hatred at those things which really are pleasant, likable, disgusting, and hateful. We develop courage, for example, by facing danger again and again, evaluating and deciding how to face it more courageously, and by reading about such circumstances, such as Peter fighting Fenris Ulf in the line of the witch in wardrobe, and then imagining myself in those situations, asking myself, how would I respond? What would I do or say? And if you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia with your children or grandchildren to stop at a time like that and to ask that child uh, what they think about Peter's response to this situation of danger and how might they operate if they were in a similar situation. So that gives children and sometimes us adults a chance to develop appropriate trained emotions. Another uh, teaching opportunity, paragraph 16. So from this point on in his lectures, Lewis will use the Tao as the term to describe the doctrine of objective value. Again, quoting Lewis himself there in the quotation marks, the belief that certain attitudes are really true and others really false to the kind of thing the universe is and the kind of things we are. Therefore, calling children delightful or old men venerable is not simply to record a psychological fact, but recognizing a quality which demands a certain response from us whether we make it or not. Emotional states can be in harmony with the Tao or out of harmony with it, reasonable or unreasonable to the Tao. <coughs> so here is a way of teaching that particular paragraph. What does Lewis accomplish by using the term the Tao rather than the phrase the doctrine of objective value? I think that's one of Michael Ward's questions, actually. Uh, I borrowed from Michael Ward. Uh, and uh, I mean we could talk about that here, for instance. Uh, Ward, I think, argues or suggests that Lewis uses the term the Tao to indicate that he's not speaking from a specifically Christian perspective. He's not trying to convey Christian ideas with this argument in favor of objective values, but he's trying to say, by using a Chinese term, to say that these are universal values rather than the private property of Christians. To what extent does the person's philosophy or worldview affect his, his actions? Again, another question worthy of fruitful discussion. Hugely important. This is another place where that fact versus value exercise that uh, we used earlier in this PowerPoint presentation could be used as we try to think about what is the Tao? Are values really truly objective? Is beauty entirely in the eye of the beholder or are there some objective criteria for determining something to be beautiful or not? Another paragraph, number 21, paragraph 21. Bet you didn't know there are, 20, are 71 paragraphs in the abolition of man. So you learned something new tonight <laughs> even if you learned nothing else. So the 21st paragraph, the head must rule the belly through the chest. I think in, uh, it was in Mere Christianity that said that sometimes our intellect need to tell our emotions where to get off. He's saying something similarly in Mere Christianity. Human reason must control the appetites through trained emotions or sentiments. By these trained sentiments, we are human. And this is, again, Lewis sort of repeating what was said earlier. It may even be said that by this middle element, the train the chest or trained sentiments that man is man, for by his intellect he is mere spirit and by his appetite mere animal. So tell stories. Uh, Michael Watson uh, gives this example. We can imagine a young boy walking with his father and older brothers and witnessing an older man tripping on the side of the road. If the father and brothers laugh at the man, the young boy will learn the wrong lesson by example and by joining in. The world is such that an older person falling down merits a compassionate response based on his being created 
in the image of God. The proper emotional response is compassion and the proper action to undertake is to help the old man. When he is older, the boy may learn the right thing to do, but he will be much more likely to do it if his emotions have been properly trained from the start. Without the aid of the trained emotions, Lewis writes, the intellect is powerless against the animal organism. Slight exaggeration, but nevertheless generally true. I'm skipping over the, the middle section, partly because I haven't developed this enti these entire 17 paragraphs with uh, teaching possibilities and discussion questions, and partly because a lot of the crucial issues are in the first and the last uh, sections of the, the lecture. So after man is abolished, there is one remaining motive, and this is from that paragraph a Latin phrase, as I will, so I command. So whatever I choose is right. Ever hear the, somebody say, I did it because I could? One of the worst reasons for doing whatever we might choose to do. Just because I have the power to be able to do it, I did it. That's, uh, we need better reasons for living the way we do than simply because we can. Lewis himself says in this last lecture, when all that says it is good has been debunked. What says I want remains. And so we are left at the mercy of the wishes, the desires of that person that's in a position to be able to command that response. And so to talk about the implications of operating on the basis of wants and desires, I mean, we could go there pretty easily this evening, right? I mean, what happens if a person in a position of power has a desire and acts on it and forces the rest of us to do that. And any thoughts? Any response to that? Tyranny? Yeah. How about consistency? What if this person in power is, uh, is in a good mood one day and a bad mood the next day? And uh, there we might not know what is the consistent perspective of this particular <laughs> leader has that, has that tremendous amount of power. Uh, those are some of the implications of operating on the basis of someone in a position of power simply desiring uh, a particular course of action. Paragraph 16 in the last lecture, the price of conquest is to treat a thing as mere nature. When we treat ourselves as mere natural objects, we have given up our souls. We are then raw material, mere nature. We are mere quantity, not quality. This is also from The Abolition of Man, a, a quotation that will probably ring a bell with a few people, especially when I put up the next bullet. The stars, Lewis writes, lost their divinity as astro astronomy developed that the dying god has no place in chemical agriculture. They look at the world as simply uh, chemicals, objects to be studied, to be mastered, to be understood, uh, but they've lost their uh, special quality as something. Uh, instead of the heavens declaring the glory of God, well, the heavens simply point this to a bunch of stars, some supernovas, some stars that are in the midst of dying and others that are in the midst of forming. In our world, said Eustace, a star is a huge ball of flaming gas. You know where I'm going. Even in your world, Ramandru says, my son, that is not what a star is, but only what it is made of. And in this, you, this world, you have already been a star, for I think you have been with Koryakin. Anybody familiar with the book uh, uh, Chronicles of Narnia and Philosophy? Highly recommend that book. I, if you're not into philosophy, I think this, you probably are into the Chronicles of Narnia. And that, that is a book with about 36 chapters, each of which is written by a professional Christian philosopher who takes an issue like this one out of the Chronicles of Narnia and develops in, I think, in a fairly readable fashion uh, for us to understand how the Chronicles of Narnia are imbued with all kinds of really important philosophical and biblical truths. And this is one, just one example of it. This is uh, Kierkegaard. 
who is happy to let science deal with plants and animals and stars, but to handle the spirit of man in such a fashion is blasphemy. Probably something that I wouldn't be surprised if Lewis had read. Paragraph 17, I think this is perhaps my last example and then we'll have a chance to discuss and to um, do some Q&A. Either we are rational human beings who must obey the absolute values of the Tao, or we are mere nature, able to be shaped in whatever way the conditioners, the people in power, the people who have no motive but their own impulses or desires wish. Belief in the Tao, which overarches rulers and ruled alike, is necessary for truly human behavior that does not tyrannize people or force obedience. So, fruitful discussion. Do you agree with Lewis that the Tao overarches rulers and ruled alike? Here's another option. I'd love to do this. Uh, if, if I were teaching Lewis over and again, I'd, I would take this on as an exercise. Create a team of students who become the conditioners that Lewis envisions in abolition and have the power to force the kinds of changes that they decide. Since in this scenario there is no objective morality, no Tao, what improvements would you make to the human individual? Other students then provide their critique after the first group makes their presentation. Are they real improvements or are they merely expansions of part of the Tao? What are the positive and negative results that could happen if these improvements were realized? And I suspect there are people in positions of power right now that are anxious to do this, maybe in the process of doing this very thing. I guess one more. There are only, I think, 24, 25 paragraphs in the last lecture. Paragraph 21, science and magic are twins, both born of the same impulse, that is subduing reality to the wishes of men through technique. So this is, I got this from Peter Kreeft, uh, his book C.S. Lewis for the Third Millennium. He suggests putting the following four things into two categories, religion, science, magic, and technology. And I'll invite you uh, silently uh, to decide which two go together as one pair and which two as another pair. And then I'll tell you what Lewis had to say about it. Okay? Make your own decision in your head. Religion, science, magic, and technology. Lewis puts religion and science together, while most would put religion and magic together. The issue is conforming the mind to objective reality out there rather than the other way around. So religion and science want to operate with objective reality that's out there and I need to adjust my way of thinking, my way of life according to uh, good theology and good science. But um, magic and technology are working the opposite way. Lewis, the serious magical endeavor and the serious scientific endeavor are twins. One was sickly and died, magic. The other strong and throve, but they were twins. They were born of the same impulse. So don't take my word for it. That's quoting Lewis out of The Abolition of Man. Uh, magician's bargain or the magician's twin, since both tried to control nature, to subdue reality to the wishes of men. Faustus, Lewis says, wants gold, guns, and girls. In other words, money, power, and sex. That's uh, Lewis. And this is my last slide. So we've got a few books that I've uh, written over the, over the years. And all three of those are out there in the lobby, I guess in the, the museum area after this is over. And uh, if you're interested in picking up one of them, we've got a few books to offer you. And that brings me to an end of this presentation. So we're ready to go to Q&A.